Hey, I'm Creech, and this is Creech and Cars, where I talk about car news, history, and culture. And today, I'm going to go on a quest to uncover the ugliest car ever made. While car designers have gifted us with some of the most beautiful objects ever, occasionally automakers create models that are, at the very least, weird, if not utterly offensive to the eyes. So today, I'm going to take you through 13 of the ugliest cars ever made, and ultimately try to decide which is the worst of them. So stay tuned until the end, where I'll reveal which car I personally think is the ugliest. Let's get started with the first car on the list, the Pontiac Aztec slash Buick Rendezvous. The Aztec is pretty famous for being ugly, but it's also become a lot cooler nowadays, which is why I put it towards the beginning here. The Aztec was designed to reinvigorate the Pontiac brand by targeting young, adventurous people, and this meant it came with a lot of cool features, like a tent that could be attached to the back of the car. But the Aztec fell short due to its unappealing exterior. It had a split headlight design and an overall ugly face, and towards the back, the proportions got awkward and the split rear window didn't help. I also decided to throw in the Aztec's less cool sister car that doesn't get talked about much, the Buick Rendezvous. The Rendezvous suffers from the same awkward proportioning, but with a less daring design. The rear hatch was blacked out, which further disrupts the proportions, and there are massive taillights that just look wrong. Next up is a car that I kinda like, the Plymouth Prowler. It seems that a lot of people have disdain for the Prowler's design, and it consistently ranks among other all-time uglies, so I felt obligated to put it in here. The Prowler was designed in an attempt to recapture the feel of hot rods from the 1930s, but part of the problem here is that car design wasn't regulated back then how it was when the Prowler was new. This meant that the designers had to add things like a front bumper, which ended up being a horrendous looking piece of black plastic that confronts onlookers and completely disrupts the front end design. The back end tried to recall classic design cues as well, but I'll admit it does look a little weird. And the trunk was very small, which also made the car very impractical. Even though it came with decent power from a V6, the unusual retro styling and high price tag meant the Prowler just couldn't sell very well. The third car on the list is the Lincoln MKT, which actually has one of the longer production runs on the list. The MKT had one generation over nine years, but it got a minor facelift in 2013. The MKT came at the beginning of the giant grill era with something that almost looks like a parody of BMW's kidney grill. Then there's also a thick ridge running down the middle of the hood. The side profile is okay, but it's proportioned more similarly to a minivan than SUV and has a raised hip past the rear doors. The rear end doesn't make things any better as the MKT has maybe the ugliest light bar I've ever seen and it droops down in the middle where the backup camera is because for some reason it made sense to put the backup camera inside the light bar. This is also one car that I can definitively say looks worse in person than in the pictures so if you're thinking it might all make sense at the real life scale, well it doesn't. The fourth car is the Chevy SSR. This is again something that I think is kind of cool is a retro styled convertible pickup truck that's design was based off GM trucks from the late 40s to early 50s, but a lot of people don't like the design. I think a big reason is that the SSR looks much smoother and less muscular than classic American trucks. The fender flares are enormous and just look goofy from many angles. And while the front end attempts to imitate classic grill and headlight design, it just looks soft and bubbly and almost cartoonish. The look doesn't suit a work truck, but the SSR was actually marketed as a performance vehicle. While it initially made 300 horsepower, for the 2005 and 6 model years, GM gave it the LS2 V8, which put out nearly 400 horsepower and got the 0-60 time down to 5.3 seconds. While performance trucks are already pretty niche, the SSR had an even narrower market segment, and coupled with a high starting price, sales never really took off. The next car is the Nissan S-Cargo. On the surface, this is a small delivery van that was produced solely for the Japanese market, and it was cancelled in 1991 after just three years of production. But since then, it has become quite well known for its abhorrent design. While it was heavily inspired by the Citroen 2CV, the S-Cargo looks more like a caricature that exaggerates the design of the 2CV in the worst ways possible. The side profile is utterly bizarre, as you can see the round roof peak at the B-pillar and slope down before an abrupt straight drop. 
The front end design is the worst offender on the S Cargo, which has the short round hood cladded in copious amounts of cheap plastic. The circular headlights look like they were stuck on at the end, and overall it's clear why no one really bought this when it was new. Next we have the third generation of the Ford Taurus. While the first and second generations of the Taurus had pretty basic but clean designs that led to them being insanely popular, Ford decided to go in a different direction as we near the 2000s, and although modern car design has its issues, I'm really glad that this didn't turn out to be the future. While today the only oval you'll find on Ford's is the logo, in 1996 Ford decided to incorporate the oval into every aspect of the Taurus's design. And this is the result. The oddly shaped front end has two oval headlights, and the side bears a rounded belt line with oval shaped door handles and oval window. The rear is even worse with an almost circular rear window and rounded light bar with oval lights inside of it. To make matters worse, Ford made a station wagon version of the Taurus that's even uglier than the sedan. The third gen didn't last very long, and the design was improved for the fourth gen when Ford began to use the New Edge design language, which featured sharper lines and creases. The next car is the third generation Nissan Cube. In 2008, Nissan introduced the third generation of the Cube, which would be brought to North American markets for the first time. Here Nissan made the classic mistake of trying to make a cheap, compact car too exciting and unique. While it has a boxy shape from the cube name, a closer look reveals round edges at every step. The cube is also asymmetrical in the rear with a side hinged hatch and a back window that wraps around to the rear door but only on the passenger side. The cube also has a weird little light bar that's all the way down on the rear bumper. While it sold okay in Japan, the cube was cancelled in North America by 2014. For the 8th car, we have repeat offender Nissan with the first generation Juke. Like the Cube, the Juke was a compact hatchback, but it went with an entirely different design philosophy. The front end is pretty strange with circular headlights sitting on top of the grille and then a separate light housing for the turn signals and brights. The side profile features large wheel arches and the rear door handles are integrated into the C-pillar. The tail lights are oddly shaped and the hatch isn't very wide, partially due to the size of the fender flare. Overall, I think the Juke isn't terrible but it's just a little funky looking. A second generation came to European markets in 2019 and while it still has some issues, the more refined design is a lot better. Next up is the Chrysler PT Cruiser. The PT Cruiser is another retro styled vehicle. It tried to recapture the best design aspects of the 30s and 40s, but ended up using the worst design features and putting them all into a cheap hatchback. The PT Cruiser is very round with large fender flares and then a completely flat rear end. And as if the standard PT Cruiser weren't bad enough, Chrysler made a convertible version that's even uglier and more disproportionate. This single generation did last 10 years and the PT Cruiser is one of the better selling cars featured on this list. The PT Cruiser was designed by Brian Nesbitt who would also design the next car on the list which is the Chevy HHR. This is pretty similar to the PT Cruiser, a smaller hatchback that tried to borrow designs from the 1940s and while it's better in some aspects, the HHR suffers from a lot of the same drawbacks of the PT Cruiser making it just about as ugly. But for GM, the HHR didn't sell as well as the PT Cruiser and was cancelled after an 8 year production run. The next car is one that's still around today, although not with its original design. The first gen Jeep Compass debuted for the 2007 model year and came with the traditional Jeep 7 slide grille and circular headlights, although it added a strange front bumper and a little light housing to the sides that completely throw off the design. Jeep designers then tried to hide the rear door handles which makes the car look strange from the side and the triangular window past the rear doors doesn't help. The back hatch is less bizarre but doesn't look great either. The Compass got a facelift in 2011 to clean up the design and then a complete redesign in 2016. For the 12th car we have the first generation Oldsmobile Aurora. In an attempt to revive the Oldsmobile brand, GM designed the Aurora to be a futuristic sedan for the late 90s, and instead we got what looks like a grotesque, elongated Chevy Cavalier. With thin headlights and a pointy front end, the Aurora had zero presence on the road, and the rear end looks very strange, with a humongous light bar that takes up most of the space as the roofline is sloped back at a sharp angle. The rear quarter panels are also quite large, but to its credit the Aurora had a low drag coefficient and with the North Star engine it was apparently very pleasant to drive. 
And finally, the 13th and final car on the list is the Fiat Multipla, more specifically the first generation, although later redesigns aren't much better. While it was never sold in the US, the Multipla is famous the world over for its interesting design. It's essentially the result of taking a compact car and giving it as much interior space as possible without giving any thought as to how that would affect the exterior. The rear end is very boxy and tall to increase headroom and the windows make up more surface area than the body panels do. But without a doubt the defining characteristic of the Multipla is the odd break that occurs as the hood ends and the windshield begins. It almost looks like the roof wasn't designed for the body but it was just stuck on there along with tiny lights that seem unnecessary. But after all that, the Multipla can comfortably fit six passengers, which almost none of its competitors can claim. So there are 13 of the ugliest cars ever made, but which one is the worst? To make my final decision, I tried to take into account other factors like designers who wanted to take a risk with something unique and it just didn't pay off, or other cars that can get a pass for being designed to be useful like the Multipla, Aztec, and Escargo. Ultimately, I think one car on this list has a horrendous design that benefits the car in no way, was completely unnecessary, and isn't even interesting to look at. And that car is the third generation Ford Taurus. This third generation replaced the best selling car in the US at the time and gave it one of the worst designs of all time, costing it the number one seller spot and shifting sales towards fleet customers. But that's just my opinion, so I want to hear from you. What do you think the ugliest car of all time is? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.